Welcome to Ask the Vet Q&A session. I'm going to read the question from uh, the writer and then I will read my response or I will explain my response to you. Um, I hope you all enjoy this. Um, I wish it could be more interactive and we could do this face to face and hopefully we'll do this next year together. So this is from Jenny Palmer of Australia. Um, if you have any advice for why cockatiels may get fat, I'd be so keen to hear your advice. My girl is 90 grams and a little plump, has a good diet of a sprinkle of seeds and breakfast of pellets. My girls get veg almost daily, sometimes a little fruit. I'm about to try, try sprouts, but one is forever eating. We'll go on to the other cage uh, for more after her own. Is there anything I need to get checked out? How do you put a bird on a diet? Um, so Jenny, thank you for your question. Uh, seed diets in flighted birds don't seem to be a problem. The same cannot be said for captive birds, flighted or not. Like humans, uh, in the sort that calories, in, uh, calories must really balance with exercise. So food volume, even of foods that are ideal, can lead to obesity. Uh, the problem, if we don't know what an ideal bird's diet is, it's difficult to accurately convey what the ideal captive diet for any bird species is. So it may surprise you, many of, uh, but to my knowledge, there's been no parrot diets, diets that have actually been studied over a full year, let alone a lifetime. Wild diets are largely observational, largely quantitative, and don't give real, uh, and don't really give or differentiate for life cycle dependent needs like an old bird, a young bird, a fledging bird. It's all one diet fits all. So captive diet recommendations cannot be solely um, based upon scientific merit. Uh, what is offered matters without a doubt. What is eaten out of what is offered is truly the diet. Uh, it's important to observe your bird's individuals uh, offered and eaten portions. In other words, uh, you have to adjust the volume and content according to their body weight. Um, so having a gram scale to weigh your birds weekly and measuring spoons to quantify the volume is a key to assuring that your birds, that your really maternal love, because what is food, food is love, uh, is not getting in the way of your pet's health. So I definitely understand your intention and your love for your bird, uh, but food cannot be equated to love because too much food really affects their health. So dietary intake is also made more difficult in multi-bird households or aviaries because food drive varies from bird to bird, bird to bird. When birds intake more calories than their bodies need, no matter the food that they are offered, no matter what food they're offered, um, undesirable weight gain occurs, even if it's good food. So it's important to realize that egg preparing, laying females gain on average about 10% of their body weight when they are ovulating. Uh, this may be a far better indicator or a far better way to predict when your bird uh, is about to become egg bound. To answer your specific question, Jenny, Jenny uh, you are evolving in specific knowledge of your bird's social behavior and how it impacts food intake. In a captive setting, it may be prudent to consider feeding more calorically dense foods, usually the most desired foods, which are seeds, while the birds are in their cage. And when the birds are out of their cage and freely roaming, they can only have access to the least fatty and least calorically dense foods, which are pellets. So if your bird wants to go explore another bird's cage, it doesn't have access to those fatty seeds. It only has access to the same pellets that it has in its own cage. So communal foraging is a normal bird behavior in social wild birds. 
and can be set up using artificial grass. So we use artificial grass, we put it in little um, cardboard flats, and we sprinkle whatever we're trying to get them to forage for, uh, and you can do that in and out of the cage. It may be a good, great practice to stimulate individual foraging in the cage with a volume appropriate amounts of seed uh, within the artificial grass. And personally, Jenny, I love your attempting to enhance the lives and welfare of your birds through sprouts, through freedom, and through um, social flighted interactions. It's obvious that you care. Um, social media nutrition experts will continue to debate the merits of pellets versus seeds versus plant matter. I will continue to advocate that you'll be a better avian steward to take the advice of knowing your bird as an individual by observation and by objective measurements. Measuring your bird's food by volume according to the bird's body weight at about 15 grams of food per 100 grams of bird's body weight is a good general rule. Adjusting the caloric density by lowering the seed content and increasing the pellet and plant matter food content when the bird's weight starts to raise is a wise practice. If their weight raises two to three grams per 100 grams of body weight, um, you'll have to respond or adjust the diet accordingly. Um, so it'll also help you respond by awareness to predict egg laying, uh, prevent fatty liver disease, hypertension, and decrease the likelihood of atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. So thank you very much for that question. Question number two comes from Cheryl Kelly from Michigan. Um, says, please ask me, or Dr. Driggers, if there's anything that can be done to prevent or treat feather picking in parrots. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question, Cheryl. Um, a discussion of feather picking, or from here I will refer to that as feather destructive behavior in captive parrots, is a lot like the Greek mythology of opening Pandora's box. It is fraught with philosophical complications and I'll attempt to summarize what I observed and learned uh, from bird behaviorists with far greater insight than I have. Um, the first thing I will say is problems cannot be solved on the same level they are created. This is not what I said, this is what Albert Einstein says. So firstly, I have never observed wild birds exhibiting feather destructive behavior. Feather destructive behavior is a captive extreme of normal grooming seen in its wild counterpart. When medical issues can be assessed and deemed unlikely by your veterinarian, we may conclude that something in captivity that occurs or does not occur is part of what causes feather destructive behavior. Whether prevention or treatment, uh, I would give you the same advice. The first thing is do a behavioral consultation with a behavioral DVM, avian preferably, or an avian behaviorist. Social media advice is largely wrong in that it is not specific to your pet. It is general advice for birds. So it is usually non-scientific based and anecdotal experiences may lead one to make bad problems worse uh, as background questions are usually incomplete or unasked. So you may get bad advice based upon the lack of relatively pertinent questions to your bird. Imagine that on Facebook. Um, answers with no questions uh, is dangerous. So go see a professional uh, from the beginning uh, for both prevention and if feather destructive behavior is already occurring, go see them for treatment. So parrots and people don't communicate in the same way. People, we communicate through um, primarily verbal communication. Parrots communicate 
primarily through their body language. We have a limited time to communicate verbally. Parrots in a home environment have their entire day to really spend their free time through observation, observing you and what you communicate to them um, verbally, but predominantly again through body language with parrots. So the things that may be talked about from a professional that you might go visit uh, or an appropriately trained DVM, uh, once again, medical issues are ruled out and unlikely to um, are unlikely to entail the things you do, things you shouldn't do, and in general, ways to think more like a bird and less like a human. So these are the general categories that I'm going to have you focus on or that your behaviorist or veterinarian might share with you. So if you have a bird that you want to prevent feather destructive behavior with, or you want to treat feather destructive behavior with, um, these are things you should not do. You shouldn't encourage pair bonding with humans. In other words, we shouldn't encourage the sexual bond. How do we encourage the sexual bond? Through physical touch. As I said, birds communicate uh, through body language, physical touch being one of those body languages. Um, so in other words, petting anywhere on a parrot communicates something very specific, especially when they are hand raised babies. So you might read that petting on the head is fine. Petting under the wing is fine. Petting above the neck is fine. Uh, I can tell you that it is a very specific uh, thing and any bird may perceive anything, pet anywhere uh, to be problematic or in other words, it may be for them considered a sexual advance. So, um, so in, to encourage pair bonding um, by physical touch, uh, is, uh, you know, just a big no-no. So the physical touch uh, thing also includes cuddling, it includes stroking, it includes time on your lap, time on your arm and shoulder time. It may be letting them eat from your mouth. We have uh, s some people that chew up food and like regurgitate to their parrot, which is a big no-no. It's called uh, aloe feeding, and it's a sure sign of a pair bond when two birds do that to each other. Tearing up paper together is like nest building, so I would not encourage you to do that. I would not encourage you to uh, let them be in your shirt or under your covers. I would limit their ability uh, I would not also uh, limit their ability to fly. In other words, feather trimming <clears throat> is a way uh, that prevents them from expressing their yeses and their noes. Um, and we're going to go into things that you should do and many of the things that you shouldn't do or you should do are um, opposite uh, of uh, these categories. So you you shouldn't feather trim, you should consider allowing them to fly, uh, in other words. Um, <clears throat> things that you shouldn't do, label and overly anthropomorphize. Anthropomorphize means that you're giving or attributing human emotions or human activities to a bird, uh, to a bird's actions. Um, we need to let birds be birds. We need objective observations for birds to be successful. Um, we have to stop pretending that we know how a parrot feels. I will just reiterate this fact and I say this to a lot of clients. Avian thoughts are far, far different than avian behaviors. Knowing what's in a bird's mind 
knowing what definitions they prescribe to it are way different than avian behavior. You can observe avian behavior, you cannot observe avian thoughts. Um, the last thing uh, that you shouldn't do, at least that I speak about regularly, is do not positively reinforce negative behaviors. So if you don't want this behavior to occur, don't positively reinforce it. In other words, if you see your bird feather picking uh, and you run over to the cage and you say, don't you feather pick, you're essentially positively reinforcing a negative behavior. If the goal of that bird was to get your attention, you positively reinforce the picking itself by going over there. Things that you should do. You uh, should create an environment that promotes communication. Uh, that includes having the parrot in a um, in the home happening areas. Having a bird room is great for cleaning for you, but it does not promote your bird from communicate. It doesn't promote communication between you and your bird. You then go and decide when to spend time with your bird not that your bird is in the house telling you who it is and how it is and what it wants. So that's frustrating to a bird. Um, likewise, if it's off into a corner of the room, that is a little bit frustrating and off-putting to the bird. Um, create an environment that allows them to move, um, that allows some flight, that allows uh, out of cage time. Um, listen to the birds. Um, learn their body language. Each bird has its unique spe specific body language. Each species varies a little bit, but be in the moment with your bird watching its body movement. Um, you can do that through structured playtime and social interactions. So I told you not to pet and do all those physical contact types of things. Things that you can do. Look up stupid YouTube videos about, you know, games you can play with your parrots. Um, set up some of those things that you might see if you watch those videos with your parrot and your parrot obviously responds to that interaction or that particular play setup that is there go buy some of that stuff and duplicate it again this is structured playtime it is social interactions and it's extremely positive for that bird to, to do that um, Educate yourself. There's lots of great websites. Uh, understandingparrots.com. Um, encourage social bonds. Now, when I say encourage social bonds for things to do, you're going to look back and say, hey, he said to not do this pair bond. That's a social bond. But, you know, one thing that I really should summarize is things not to do is that sexual bond or that pair bond. Things to do is social bonds. Social bonds are really friend to friend interactions. And I would encourage the whole family to be involved in that, not one person. When one person's involved, usually that ends up being something that moves into a pair bond relationship. So encourage the whole family to interact with the, the bird that you have in your house. Um, also, positively reinforce positive behaviors. So if your bird is playing, if your bird is communicating, if you're having socially enriched times, if your bird flies, if your bird does something that you want them to do, positively reinforce it. What you're actually doing is giving them structure uh, to how you want them to behave, not just positively reinforcing the things that they, you don't want them to do. So you're structuring time for playing and letting them know how you want them to behave and interact. Um, other things um, that I just want you to think about, so we talked about things to do, 
things not to do and and uh, this other things category that I've created um, and I don't want you to confuse being a provider of food water and shelter will not ever make your parrot grateful being a great positive reinforcer through great parrot communication will make your parrot have a healthier relationship with you and remember it's not your verbal i love you it is your body language that they are reading so think about research and find ways to figure out what their body language is and what their body language means it may be a look that they get in their eyes it may be like the shape of their eyelid how they hold their feathers um, how they hold different parts of their body um, you know if they get red in their facial patches if they position their beak in a particular way or move away or towards you or how they body position themselves on perches so all those things are are body language elements and you have to figure out what your bird means when they do those things thank you for that great question the third question i have is from shirley and she says, my 40-year-old uh, W.L. Amazon what, has really dry feet. What can I put on them that is not going to hurt him? So thank you, Shirley, for your question. Uh, and I'm sure many of uh, others have that question as well. Uh, where can you get a good parrot pedicure is, <laughs> is the question. Um, so as I look down... Uh, at my feet uh, it appears that I might too need to get some advice uh, seriously the big things that I would uh, look generally speaking uh, for my 40 year old W out on Amazon parrot would be its overall health I can tell you that high blood pressure causes decreased flow to the extremities the feet being one of those um, it uh, arthritis with age occurs arthritis in the neck can prevent them from normally maintaining the skin health of or on their feet um, diets that also may be deficient in vitamin a uh, for um, for those heavy seed eaters that would be a common problem uh, it also may uh, promote poor skin formation and normal shedding um, or normal exfoliation, if you will. Um, as long as those things are specifically discussed and assessed with your veterinarian, I would consider using weekly uh, some topical vitamin E on those dry areas. So you can just bust open a little capsule and spread a very thin layer on that feet to keep it moist. moist if dryness is the problem and those medical issues are worked out. Thank you for your great question. My next question comes from Mon Monica uh, and uh, it is uh, I've had I've owned two Conyers for 25 years. Vet visits uh, for checkups are extremely stressful to them and it takes them days for their behaviors to return to normal. Even though my vet is gentle I will be bitten if I attempt to interact with them after the visit. Do they really need yearly blood tests, etc., or can I let it go longer between visits as long as they look and behave healthy? Um, and again, thank you for the question, Monica, and especially for your avian advocacy. 29 years is a long time for any conure, and um, that really demonstrates your dedication and commitment to their well care. So no doubt vet visits can be uh, stressful for the stewards and for the birds, and they can get worse over time as stress reinforces fear when nothing positive seems to occur at the vet visits. And this is from the bird's perspective. Um, 
I would recommend that you talk to your vet about using intranasal into the nostril sedative known as midazolam prior to the exam. It is safe, very safe, uh, except don't feed your parrot prior to the visit. Um, it's a, and basically, um, the sedative uh, is an amnesiac. It functions to make them not remember. I personally call it Disneyland in a bottle because I refer to it as the happiest place on earth. It can also be easily reversed and they respond very quickly. I feel your dilemma and the stress of it all. It's important to know that you are your bird's advocate and most vets, when they understand your goals and perspectives, will help you make the best decision. So I would encourage you to communicate with your vet as we are trained problem solvers and we desire to help you through these processes. Thank you for your question. My next question comes from Trisha Gately of Tennessee and the question reads, I've just lost my dear cockatiel Gatsby and it appeared that he had the same some kind of seizure or a stroke. He was only about five years old. What causes strokes and seizures in cockatiels and what can be done to prevent them. Also, are male cockatiels more prone to them than females? Many thanks. Um, first of all, Tricia, very sorry for your loss. Um, the size of love uh, for your birds doesn't match their size overall. So lots of things can cause them to seizure or stroke, but five years is very young for that to happen. It is tough uh, to do, but allowing your veterinarian to perform an autopsy would be the only way to get objective information about what went wrong with Gatsby. Genetic defects in the heart or in the, vesicle, in the vessels are possible. Unknown exposure to toxins or metabolic defects in the organs or tumors, neoplasia, uh, are a few possibilities. I find females with calcium issues may be more prone to that than males, uh, but other, um, other people may have a different experience, other veterinarians. So good nutritional advice, routine veterinary care and diagnostics are good discussions about risk management in the home and are good starts at prevention. It sounds like you may want to try this over again. Um, uh, after you get over this loss and I would encourage you to do so uh, but establish a good relationship with uh, a vet and with some local bird stewards to be connected with. Thank you for your question. <laughs> My next question is from Yaiwen Cheng. Um, I hope I pronounced that okay. Um, it says hello I got a baby parrotlet last November but after a month and a half and at four months of age, he suddenly got sick and passed away within 24 hours. None of the avian clinics were available to see him. Only symptoms were lethargy, nausea, regurgitation. And I had the veterinary school in Oregon conduct a number of necropsy tests with no findings. Question one is, what should I have done or had on hand to help my little bird if vets aren't available? I did keep him warm and I hand fed him a little baby bird food as well as gave him homemade Pedialyte, but he did not want to, I, but, but didn't want to aspirate him. Uh, the second question is, I've not had a pleasant experience in the ER clinics, um, but I should, but should I have taken him to the animal ER? when there aren't avian experts. The wait in the ER is about six to eight hours in the, in the car, so I was also concerned about the cold for my bird. And lastly, she said, I've been grieving since um, he passed and have no closure because I don't know how he got sick and died. Um, want to know how I could prevent this situation to arise again and thank you so much for considering my question. So um, thank you, Wen, for your question. 
Um, many people struggle with the same finding an avian veterinarian that is available at emergency clinics. Um, emergency clinics are designed really for dogs and cats and can be definitely uninviting and unpleasant for birds uh, and distressing to their owners. Um, oftentimes you don't have a relationship with the emergency vet um, or at least hopefully you don't um, and that makes it that much harder. So um, from a bird's perspective, being prey species, um, birds smell, they see, and they feel threats that we normalize. We know dogs and cats are, you know, good to us. Birds think that dogs and cats think they taste like chicken. So birds can only show so many symptoms and uh, are ill and often a history, a physical examination, and diagnostics are necessary. Uh, it is difficult to say without a necropsy, animal autopsy, what may have killed your bird. Um, and from the way that you phrased the question, I was not for sure if you attempted to have an autopsy done on this bird or you had just done autopsies in the past. But um, know that even the most experienced avian vets and um, pathologists don't always find a cause of death and it's frustrating and sometimes expensive and the only way that we can improve um, either our practice of veterinary medicine or you improve um, the things you may be doing at home that may have compromised your bird's uh, uh, life. Um, so again, it's unclear if you had a necropsy done or you've had necropsies not be successful in the past at getting you information. Um, so I am sorry for your loss uh, and I, I'm just happy that you're motivated to understand better. And my only advice in preparation um, for emergency types of situations in the future is a colleague of mine, Dr. Stephanie Lamb, did a really good job in a first aid seminar at lafebervet.com. Um, so if you watch that, she can tell you basic things to have on hand to prepare yourself um, for avian emergencies when these types of things are not available, when emergency clinics are not available with experienced avian practitioners. So please watch the video and uh, I hope it will help you should the need arrive next time. Thanks. So the next question comes from Yvonne Jones from Oregon. I'm so happy to see that people around the country and uh, even from as far as Australia are interested to hear about the OASIS and um, you know engage in this uh, activity of the veterinary questions Q&A. Um, so her question was, I have a 28 year old blue and gold macaw. I've raised him from an egg and who has ongoing problem with wing and tail feathers that don't want to zip up. Um, might this be caused by a dry house and his reluctance to bathe? Um, many birds are reluctant to bathe, uh, just like small children, right? Um, but, but essentially, um, uh, thank you for the question regarding your blue and gold. Um, feathers are formed from um, basically seasonal hormonal influences and germinal feather tissue at the base of the feather. The germinal tissue gives rise to a feather uh, and it's shaped sort of like a donut. So that donut shape or that disc gives rise to the entire feather. So over time in our captive environments, a lot of parrots are predisposed to trauma, falling, perch spaces are weird. Uh, you know, they have their flight feathers trimmed and can't balance well. Um, so there may be damage to the feathers through those falls, through tears, through punctures, even self-induced um, trauma through biting and feather destruction. Additionally, some viruses create inflammation in those germinal discs and in the feather pulp that can damage that germinal disc. So the inflammation uh, and premature pulling out of those feathers, so once something's inflamed, a bird says it's inflamed, it itches, and then they pull it prematurely. They can actually pull a piece of that germinal disc with them, and that germinal disc ends up um, uh, being a key component to the normal feather uh, coming out uh, in a normal way that zips up the feather or causes it not to twist. 
Um, so proper humidity um, and normal self-maintenance of his or her feathers can be major contributors to feather damage at a level of that germinal tissue. So those feathers really indicate, the abnormal feathers, your macaw, probably just indicates trauma to that germinal disc and how that happened is what the question might be. Thank you for your great question. This next question comes from Adam and Laura, both Oasis caregivers. I uh, wanted to make sure I gave you some time, um, but it says what happens um, when African greys cry blood tears? So some people have seen bloody tears in African greys, um, but basically they are typically stress-associated congestion of the tear glands. So um, while infection can cause it, it's usually the bird is very fearful. It may be holding its breath uh, or struggling while it's being held. Uh, once they're free, the tears clear up readily, uh, but the tear glands producing our natural, you know, white uh, tears or clear tears get really congested and the blood leaks into those glands and then gets, you know, put uh, out as red tears. So it can be really distressful when you see it. Um, it always makes me feel sad uh, when I do see it. And one thing I usually do, uh, if it does happen, is I offer the um, bird stewards the ability to use the sedative of midazolam, as I mentioned earlier, to minimize the perceived stress on the bird. And it really works well to alleviate the anxiety. And uh, it, it is really, really sad when you do see it. Thank you for the question. Hello again, we're gonna answer a question from a local Arizona um, resident named Robert Weaver. Uh, and his question entails, um, how important are natural sunlight and baths to the health of our birds? Explain the importance of both exposure to natural sunlight and baths and how that plays a role in our parrot's health. Um, thanks, Robert. That's a very important question. Um, and I will just say parrots haven't evolved uh, with roofs over their head and parrots haven't evolved um, being blocked from both sunlight and rain. So um, captive parrots rely on our compassion to recognize our responsibilities to basically give birds access to the same opportunities as wild birds have. So in other words, being exposed to sunlight and being exposed to rain and humidity and having ways and tools to clean themselves. So UV, uh, ultraviolet or sunlight, encourages better bone formation through the conversion of vitamin D and absorption of calcium. It's difficult to quantify, however, the psychological benefits of sun, uh, but know that birds that are inside and exhibit feather destructive behavior, one of the things that we do is to place them outside to get UV light, to have more opportunities and choices, which seems to help enrich their lives. And sometimes that alone can help um, mute the feather destructive responses. So feather conditions of birds kept outside is usually overall much better. And uh, lastly, bathing is a normal part of feather maintenance. So sunlight and bathing are both great enrich en enrichments. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for the question.